Hello, welcome to the Friday, October 6, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Published a brief diary and tool earlier today that will take a PCAP file and extract HTTP requests and turn them into curl commands. Curl, if you're not familiar with it, is a little Unix command line tool that allows you to send HTTP requests. So what this tool does essentially, it allows you to replay the requests that were included in that PCAP file. I ran into the need for such a tool when I was working recently with a web-based API where I tried to sort of send some requests to it. And I always like to do it in the browser, but in this particular case, it was really not that easy in the browser to figure out which request cost what. So that tool came in handy in order to get all of the requests extracted at the same time and make it easier to screen through for the ones that are actually important. And Apple today released an update for macOS High Sierra fixing a rather embarrassing security flaw. With macOS High Sierra, Apple introduced a new file system, the Apple file system. And with that, of course, you can also encrypt your files as you were able before. But the implementation of the encryption had a pretty interesting bug. Now, when you set up encryption for a particular drive, you can also set up a password hint. However, it turned out that Apple saved the password in the password hint, not the actual text that you entered as a password hint. So whenever you used a password hint, no matter what text you entered there, it would be replaced with the password. And then when you request the password hint, what you actually get back is the clear text password. Now, when I saw this a couple days ago, I think it was the first time, I was a little bit confused how this could happen because the password is actually never saved anywhere. The password is just used to encrypt the actual disk encryption key. So it itself is not saved. Just when you type it in, it's used to decrypt that encryption key. Well, it must happen during the setup where really just the password is saved in the wrong spot or, well, uh, they pull the wrong variable in order to save it as a password hint. And Apache released yet another update for Tomcat. Now, the reason this is tricky is because a about a week or two ago, there were two flaws in Tomcat that sound exactly like this flaw, but uh, well, uh, given that there are different CVEs for it, it's probably not patched by these prior patches. This latest flaw is CVE 2017-12617. The others were 12615 and 12616. So this is just the next number in the sequence. The flaw is the same that it's possible to upload JSP files to a server if the HTTP put command is enabled. Now, by default, put is not enabled, so by default, you should not be vulnerable. But in particular, recently with the REST APIs and such, put has become more popular than it was in the past. This is also something if you're not using it in your network and likely you are not using it, then this is pretty easily addressed at the web application firewall level as well. So if you have put enabled, this is a critical flaw. If not, then don't sweat it too much. Apply the patch in accordance with your regular patch policies. So it's a Friday today and we do have an STI student again uh, this week. I'm here with uh, Dallas Hazelhorst and he's going to talk a little bit about healthcare protocols and such. So uh, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, my name is Dallas Hazor, so I'm a STI student. I'm in uh, pretty much the uh, final year of the program, so I've been in for a little bit. Uh, can't say enough good things, obviously, about SANS and the, the STI program uh, and what all I've learned over time. So your paper was about healthcare protocols, HL7 here in particular. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what this protocol is about and how it's being used in healthcare? Sure. It's HL7 is a clear text means of system to system communications. It's pretty much ingrained in healthcare. It's hard to get exact numbers really on how 
you know, pervasive it is in healthcare. But if you wanted my estimation, I would say it's in well over 95% of the organizations. And that includes smaller clinics and, uh, and everyone else in that medical space. So it's really the protocol that's being used to sort of push uh, healthcare data around in the hospital or uh, also between hospitals and doctor offices and such? Or? Yeah, correct. I mean, think about it in the sense that for every single thing that you would do as a patient, you know, whether it's get admitted, whether it is having orders sent, having results from tests sent, um, any sort of allergy information, all of that is actually sent over HL7 and it goes, you know, system to system. Um, so, you know, if you have a an admission on this system, it might send over to a lab system in order to keep uh, your ADT data uh, in sync. Okay, so very important, I guess, very hard to change. You would have to change all of these uh, different systems in order to upgrade HL7 in a meaningful way, right? Yeah, you, and you're absolutely correct. And it's not like there's a competing standard. Uh, you know, there there are some newer standards. There's HL7 version 3. Uh, specifically, what I dealt with or what I dove into was version 2. Um, there's also a newer fire standard. But as with anything, uh, especially in IT, it's going to take a long, long time in order for those changes to really be realized. Now, when I looked at the standard in your paper, uh, sort of you know, what came into mind was HTTP. You know, HTTP is also a very insecure protocol, and in some ways, security was sort of added to it uh, with a TLS. Uh, is that an option uh, with HL7? So, you know, the the second paper, and that was actually a two part paper process, which I was told kind of that was the the first one that uh, that Sands had done, at least for the gold papers. Um, but the, uh, the second paper is actually called attacking and defending. So that attacking portion is looking at ways that you can specifically, you know, make modifications in line, you know, and, uh, you know, think about ARP spoofing and editor cap and all the, all the different ways that we can modify packets in line and in real time. And then the second part of that is actually defending. And the defending part was extremely... Uh, I guess vital, <laughs> uh, not to use a healthcare term, but vital for me to make sure that it was part of the paper because I wanted to make sure that there were defensible mechanisms, uh, you know, that were that people could take and utilize on their systems today without having to change, you know, the underlying protocol or anything else. And so part of those defenses. We're using, you know, something that a lot of the folks are familiar with, which is just SSH tunneling. So instead of just sending that that data back and forth clear text, we're actually using it that SSH tunnel to encrypt the data for us. And then because we're not making many modifications or the, the modifications that we're making um, don't change the underlying data, it's actually able to send that. Um, with just a, a minor change on the sending system, and it's not actually any changes on the receiving system beyond that SSH tunnel uh, uh, creation. So that, that would be one workaround. Now, you know, with, with these tunnels and TLS or SH for that matter, one risk is obviously these downgrade attacks. So with these SH tunnels, you would be able to enforce that data is only being sent through that tunnel and the downgrade wouldn't be possible? Correct. Correct. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we'd have to go through some SSH hardening, um, you know, and make sure that, uh, you know, simple things like V1s disabled and and some other things. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it'd be all the standard things that we're used to as far as uh, making sure that a SSH tunnel is secure as uh, possible. Now, if I remember your paper correctly, uh, the protocol is also used for medical devices in part or uh, so to control them or I guess, to adjust prescriptions and the like? Yeah, not necessarily to control the devices. Um, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. It's not uh, been my experience. But um, for, you know, basic telemetry, a lot of that data will actually come as a short bursts of HL7 data. So, you know, your, your heart monitors or anything like that can actually come over as HL7 as well. So once again, going back to the, the potential for modifying that clear text data, you know, there, there's definitely that, uh, that possibility there. And that's uh, the, the issue really is that, you know, it, that's exacerbated by the most hospitals 
um, once again, this is my my experience, is that they have a very flat network. And I mean, that's not unlike many other organizations throughout the world. And keep in mind that a lot of these tunnels were created, you know, eight years ago. And so, you know, network segmentation was not a, a real uh, widely used defense at the time. So a lot of these are sitting on the exact same network segment as, say, your end users and their workstations and, and things that they're checking email on. So that's, that's really another reason why it becomes a much bigger issue than, oh, okay, this is just clear text. Well, we'll just throw it off on this uh, other network segment here. It actually becomes a, uh, quite a challenge just to do something like that. I've never worked with these devices, but I can imagine it would be quite hard to, to sort of set up SH tunnels and such, like you know, from a heart rate monitor back to a collector. Uh, in cases like this, uh, is network segmentation really your only choice, or are there any sort of add-on devices? I could sort of think about a, a Raspberry Pi proxy or something simple, stupid like that, uh, uh, to sort of retrofit uh, these devices. Have you used anything like that, or? I have not. Now, that's something that I do talk about uh, quite in depth in the paper as far as uh, some of the defense mechanisms, because some of you're absolutely correct. Some of them uh, don't even have the horsepower to do uh, some of the SSH tunneling. So network segmentation, um, you know, maybe some uh, some site to site or network segment VPNs, um, because a host based VPN obviously wouldn't be a choice as well. Um, so there's there are some different options available, and you know, you know, throwing your uh, Raspberry Pi idea out there, I could absolutely see that as a potential solution as well. Now, um, when I teach defending web applications, I always uh, put up a healthcare as actually an area where you know availability is really really important. It's not really just about uh, privacy. Uh, yes, we all want our you know, health information to be protected, but in the end, if I show up in the ER, I want doctors to have quick access to my records. Um, is this sort of also a problem in particular, you know, this change, like moving away from something like HL7? It works. It works well enough. Is this sort of why it sticks around? It, you know, it sticks around just because it was not security, especially when HL7 was originally created. It was not... <laughs> something that we thought about. We, I mean, I can remember, you know, my very first job still in college was actually as an integration specialist doing HL7 interfaces. And so, I mean, I can remember, you know, creating some of those interfaces. And, you know, when you actually bring that interface live, it was high fives all around. I mean, you thought you were done. Um, so, you know, there's not, uh, you know, it's just not something that's readily able to change um, just because it, it's been ingrained in those uh, environments for so long. Now, you know, the reason why I kind of came back to this, you know, you're thinking, well, why did you look look at HL7 again after all these years? A few years ago, I was actually at a hospital, a larger hospital, and I was doing tons of security uh, consulting for that hospital. And their HL7 interface person actually left um, kind of unexpectedly. And, and that's not uh, obviously a uh, widely, widely held skill. And they knew, uh, the CIO actually at the time knew that I, that was something that I had done. So I said, sure, you know, I'll take a look at it. And I guess the, the, the nice way to say is that I was absolutely appalled that they were still doing things exactly the same way that I had been used to doing them, you know, 12 years prior. So, you know, that's where this, this whole idea of really examining HL7 and knowing the ins and outs of it um, really, really came about. And also, you know, with my security background, how would I actually secure this? So now you wrote these two papers about HL7. What's next for you here uh, on your journey? Well, that's a great question. Well, f first and foremost is finishing my master's degree with SANS. Um, but, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of things that I, I get interested in, so I, I can kind of go uh, different directions, especially being a uh, freelance consultant. Um, also, I'm on the uh, B-Sides uh, Kansas City Organization Committee. I'm one of the, the primary organizers, so planning and related announcements for that should be uh, getting in full swing here pretty quick. That's uh, coming up here next April. Um, and also, you know, I, I do uh, write 
uh, a fair amount on my blog, um, linuxincluded.com. I just do kind of some tips and tricks that I picked up over the years trying to secure and defend some SMBs over the, you know, over time. And uh, I'd really like to use open source tools such as Nagios, PFSense, and things of that nature. So uh, um, I, actually, you, you had... Uh, taking a look at some of the the prior work with uh, sending pfsense logs to uh, d shield as well i don't know if you remember right, that yeah just i a few remember that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so uh thanks uh, for being here and uh, talking about your work uh, dallas so thanks everybody for listening and uh, talk to you again on monday